Welcome everyone to our Human Rights Day presentation with Frank Bonopolis. My name is Mary Kate Small. I'm a member of Parks Christi, Maine. We've had the pleasure of working with Martha at Peace Action uh, to promote, promote this evening's event and are grateful for the many different main groups that are co-sponsoring. Thanks to each of you. The format this evening will be a talk with slides followed by questions. We ask that if you can, please put your questions in the chat and Frank will answer them at the end of the talk in the order that they're received. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing Frank uh, to all of you. Um, I received an email last year uh, saying that Frank was coming to teach a course on Guantanamo at Colby College and wondering if there were any of us that might like to do an action together on Guantanamo. And so we did that and uh, quite a few of us had the pleasure of, of being together. Um, Frank is from the DC area. He's a human rights attorney and part of his work, as you know, uh, includes representing prisoners uh, held at Guantanamo Bay. Specifically, Abdul Malik Bajabu is a Kenyan who has been held uh, now going on 16 years. So uh, the only thing that I can say from my short times with Frank is how grateful I am to him for the work that he does. I appreciate um, the fact that he's very humble about what he does, and uh, it seems to be a common thread with folks I know who are doing this very hard work, and uh, it seems that um, some of us are uh, in awe of people who do the kind of things that Frank does, um, but the message that I seem to get from Frank and others is just to do our best wherever we're at, to do what we can do uh, in the places that we are. And so without further ado, Frank, I thank you so much for being here and welcome you this evening. Um, I, I picked this quote from Merton because, you know, um, human rights law, right, or as it's known, international humanitarian law um, is a standard and a norm uh, for, uh, for our society so that, um, um, you know, um, behavior um, that's destructive, well, you know, like genocide, uh, like torture, um, it, it is outlawed. And, and uh, the standards of international human rights law are what are to guide us if we're to have um, uh, a, a, a society that's based on laws and, and not on, on force and, and not on violence. Um, so Merton at one point, you know, wrote that sometimes, uh, you know, that society's norms need to have norms uh, for an objective good. And that's what international human rights law is. It, it sets a norm of a, for objective good. Um, and when the norms of society become arbitrary, capricious, and pragmatic, you know, there's the danger that, uh, you know, society goes ahead and cooperates with injustice uh, and, and with evil. And it's, that's exactly what happened with Guantanamo. Um, as you'll see in, in the talk, as, as I go through the slides, what I try and do in 45 minutes is just to explain how, how Guantanamo was established as a place where prisoners could be brought, brought and then tortured, and you know, how that came to be. And the way it came to be was because people you know, started taking the law as something that was arbitrary, capricious, and pragmatic. And as a result, you know, almost our entire country went along with, with what was happening in Guantanamo once it found out, because for a long time it was held to be secret. So anyway, I just wanted to, you know, begin with uh, Thomas Merton and, and recognize his presence um, tonight. So, um, uh, so um, after the 9-11 the events, right, the U.S. implemented 
uh, what it called extrajudicial means to capture suspected terrorists. At the National Security Council meetings, the CIA outlined plans for covert operations to fight, kill, and apprehend terrorism suspects and transfer them to third countries. These are what was known as extraordinary rendition to black sites for interrogation. Um, uh, the next day on the 16th, you have Vice President Cheney on Meet the Press saying that, you know, we have to work through the dark side, you know, uh, a lot of what needs to be done here will have to be done without any discussion, and we use any means at our disposal. So you can begin to think about how these people, how Cheney and, and the architects of the global war on terror thought, you know, they thought in terms of something that was to be done secretly without any discussion in a democracy and, and, and to work um, in the shadows and on, uh, on the side of what is violence and evil, you know, in my view. The, uh, so the legal architects of the global war on terror um, implemented their plan and based on an expansive notion of executive power. So, you know, we, we have a, um, a government where we have balances between the executive branch and the legislative branch and the judiciary branch. But people like Cheney and people like David Addington, who was Cheney's counsel, um, and the other, the people who, who um, you know, the architects of the global war on terror on, on these plans, they believe in a strong um, executive, uh, an executive that sort of can can do what they want without having um, all the time to to be accountable to Congress. And uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as the Iran Contra Minority Report uh, stated, and it was authored by Cheney and by Addington. You know, sometimes they feel bound to a certain monarchical um, notions of prerogative. You know, the king's prerogative, something that the founders of this country. Um, we're trying not to establish in the Constitution. But what you do is you have a movement for a strong executive among very conservative um, people in the government, uh, uh, Donald Trump being just the latest um, example uh, of that uh, philosophy. Uh, but um, in the Bush administration, these people were in power. Um, so on September 17th, um, Bush issues a presidential memorandum of notification. So that's a, a memorandum to Congress um, stating that the CIA has been giving, given unprecedented authorities, right? It could use significant discretion in determining whom to detain. It can conduct covert operations without having to have any formal approval for operations anywhere in the world. It could use lethal force, including armed drones, and it could operate black sites. Um, before this, the CIA had to get permission from the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees to conduct operations in order to to um, um, assault people, take people into custody, um, or, 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 or kill them. Um, and, and now it, it was given the authorities to do so on its own. Um, uh, Congress then passes the authorization to use military force. Um, if you remember um, from, the, from the Vietnam War era, after the Vietnam War, uh, the Congress um, passed a law requiring the president to give notice um, uh, 60 days after um, military operations have begun um, uh, in order to to keep the president limited and and uh, you know held on a uh, you know held accountable for committing our military and so the authorization to use military force is what authorized the president to go ahead and begin the the war on terror against the against the you know the people at the time and this was a new authorization those who we determined planned authorized committed or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th or harbored such organizations. So Congress's authorization was limited to those who were involved in the, in the, in the September 11th attacks. But the White House interpreted the president's military powers much more broadly um, and beyond the authorization to use military force. What you have is this notion of a strong executive power. And so in a memorandum um, to, uh, to the White House counsel, um, from the Justice Department, um, the Justice Department um, explained that the president can deploy military force preemptively against terrorist organizations, whether or not they're linked to the September 11th attacks. So, so the the um, the the architects of the global war on terror um, are asserting the president's prerogative to go anywhere in the world and go after anybody they determine is a terrorist, 
and not limited to the authorization Congress gave them, which was limited to the September 11 attacks. So the, the president then issues military, the mil, uh, military order number one, which was the military order of November 13th, 2001, which basically um, by this time, the US had invaded Afghanistan. Um, anybody who's placed in the custody of, of the US as a result of being captured will be given to the, uh, will be placed under the control of the Secretary of Defense, right? And importantly, those individuals will not be able to seek any remedy or proceeding in a US court. In other words, these people would be captured, they would be imprisoned, uh, they could be interrogated, uh, and, and later will see tortured. Um, and they don't have a right uh, to uh, habeas corpus or, or any other means of redress in a US court. So this was um, in the, uh, the military order of November 13th, 2001. Um, and, and once this, this military order was published in the Federal Register, which publishes all presidential documents, the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights started to inquire, what is this all about? You know, it, this can't be, it's not right, it's not constitutional. And that's when the litigation to find out what was going on um, uh, with, uh, with the military capturing prisoners, um, that's when the litigation started. And it took about three and a half to four years before documents were made available to the Center for Constitutional Rights and to the ACLU, um, exposing you know what what the plan was and what these memos uh, said. Um, so the people who could be detained under the military order was broad. It was anybody um, who uh, you know engaged, aided, abetted, conspired to commit acts of uh, international terrorism, or prepared or caused injury to the United States. Um, uh, or anyone who knowingly harbored any such individuals. And, you know, knowingly harbored is a loose term. You know, what does it mean? It means that, you know, somebody came to your house um, and you put them up overnight and you didn't know they were a terrorist. And lo and behold, they turn out to be a suspected terrorist. Does that mean that then you can be detained? Well, that's what happened to some of the prisoners uh, at Guantanamo. Um, they, you know, they opened up hospitality to people who turned out to be suspected terrorists and they were rounded up. Um, Guantanamo was selected as the place to hold prisoners because the US believed that courts could not exercise habeas jurisdiction there, right? So in this memorandum for the uh, Department of Defense General Counsel, right, from the Office of Legal Counsel and the Department of Justice, um, you know, they concluded that the great weight of legal authority indicates that a federal district court could not properly exercise jurisdiction over an alien detained at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So they selected Guantanamo because they thought that the courts couldn't reach it. They could do everything they wanted to there in secret. And as they proceeded, they didn't tell anybody what was going on there or, or uh, other than whatever propaganda, you know, the Department of Defense wanted to tell the, the media about who was going to, uh, to um, Guantanamo. So who was supposedly sent to Guantanamo? So according to uh, Secretary uh, of Defense Rumsfeld, it was the worst of the worst. Uh, you know, in a, in a news conference, uh, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said that the people who uh, were being sent to Guantanamo were people who would gnaw through the hydraulic lines uh, in the back of a C-7 to bring it down. Um, the worst of the worst. Uh, so this is a testimony by uh, one of the military police guards at Guantanamo. You know, you know he thought because they were told that the people that he would be guarding were known terrorists, that many of them helped to plan the 9-11 attacks, and they would be coming face to face with the worst people in the world. And so, as he says, you know, he and others were, were uh, annoyed and mad, and they were out to get revenge. So you can imagine now the, the kind of um, uh, culture that you have in Guantanamo, where you're bringing in prisoners from all around the world, people who are Muslim, right? Uh, people who are of color, like men, young men, and some boys, and, and they're presented, um, you know, to these guards who think that they committed the 9-11 events and they were out to get avenged. You know, you, you can imagine what kind of violence would ensue from that. Um, uh, this is the testimony of one of the Arabic translators, Eric Saar, right? You know, he was led to believe these were the worst of the worst, right? People who had extensive training from Al-Qaeda, they had planned the 9-11 attacks. Um, who really was sent to Guantanamo? So according to the Center for Constitutional Rights, right, it's 780 men and boys, all of them Muslim, were in prison since January 2002. 86 percent, 
86% were sold to the U.S. for a bounty, typically $5,000. That means that in Afghanistan and Pakistan, warlords would, would just round up people and sell them to the U.S. 22 or more were children when taken in detention. That means they were 17 or under. Some One was as young as 14 years old. Nine men have died while detained at Guantanamo. Now, three were, were murdered. The, the U.S. says that they committed suicide. Um, the, the prisoners and others say that they were murdered. So I, I've put here murdered. Um, somebody from the U.S. Uh, might contest that and say that they were suicides. Uh, um, the U.S. refused to disclose the prisoners' names and basis for their detention until April 2006. So the first people came to Guantanamo in January of 2002, and it wasn't until the efforts of, of lawyers and litigation that in April 2006, more than four and a half, four years later, right, that you got the names of the people who were there. 35 men currently remain detained there. There are still 35 men there. 23 have not been charged with any crime or, off or offense and are indefinitely detained. That means they've been put in there and not charged. And, they're, and, and, it's not, and they were never told when they would be released or that they would be released. 20 of these 23 have been approved for release in the process, and they're waiting to actually be released. 12 have active cases before military commissions. So these 12 are 9-11 uh, planners and other high-level Al-Qaeda or affiliate organizations who have been charged with war crimes. Those, these 12 have been actually charged with war crimes. Um, uh, the rest haven't been charged at all. Um, but 20 of the rest have been approved for release and they're still waiting to be released. Some have been waiting for more than two and a half years. It costs more than $13.5 million per prisoner to operate Guantanamo at this, at this point. Um, uh, the uh, Pakistan admitted to turning over you know, prisoners to the U.S. for millions of dollars in bounties. The General Pervez Musharraf in his book, The Line of Fire, uh, you know, admitted, yeah, Pakistan turned over 369 al-Qaeda fighters to the U.S. They earned millions of dollars, you know, millions of dollars. Um, so I, I want to play for you a, a clip by Shakar Amr. Shakar uh, is a, a, a Saudi citizen and a British legal res resident. Um, he was actually a, an English translator for law firms in, uh, in London. And he went to Guantanamo, he went to Afghanistan, um, after the U.S. invaded Afghanistan to help the people there suffering from the war. Uh, he was kidnapped by warlords and sold to the U.S. for a, for a bounty. Um, and I'm going to play, his interrogators blamed him for the 9-11 events. And I just want to um, share with you a, a four-minute clip of an interview he did with the BBC about um, his interrogation. So let me see, uh, how do we do this? In terms of the kind of interrogation you received at Guantanamo Bay, can you describe that for us? Again, I said, you know, they really were not looking for the truth. They're not looking for answers, you know. They're just looking to blame you on something, regardless if you are telling the truth. As soon as soon they see you, you know, giving him some answers that, you know, it shows you that you are a human being. They won't accept it. But what are they asking you? You know, one of the incidents really, I can't forget, I cannot, because I know, I don't know much about 9-11. Truly, I don't know much about it. I don't know, uh, you know, what happened there, truly. So for me, it's just like, uh, okay, two building collapse, you know. And one day I was in an interrogation and the interrogator brought a book. And it has all scenery from 9-11. From and then he kept opening, you know, one page after another page. And then suddenly he stopped on a page where somebody jumped from all the way up, God knows, 100th floor or something. And he's jumping, running away from the fire. So I looked at it, I mean, in my mind, I mean, the guy is going to get killed by fire. But he knows when he jumped, he's going to get killed anyway. So I start crying. And he looked at me, he couldn't believe it. He's crying. So he grabbed the, that huge book and he just picked it up and smacked it on the, on, the, on the table. And he looked at me, you crying? You did this? I said, I didn't do nothing. Why do you think I did that? 
And that's why I thought they really, you know, they don't want to even believe you are a human being. They don't want you to feel that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just a man with feelings, you know, just like you. But they don't want to believe that. And when they get to these moments where you show them that you have feelings just like them, they hate it because they know what they are doing to you. How did these? So um, I, I recommend that you, um, you can find this uh, on YouTube, this, uh, this interview. It's a BBC interview with Chakra Amr. And you could, it's, uh, it goes on for about an hour and 30 minutes, I believe, but it's, it's worth watching. He goes through a lot of, he was, the, Shaka was at, at Guantanamo from 2002 until about 2014. And so um, and because he spoke English, um, he, he was a, an intermediary between the demands of the prisoners and, and, and the administration. And, and, you know, the administration thought he was a leader of the, and they subjected him to very harsh uh, brutality. Um, uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a good interview to, to learn um, about Guantanamo, um, as are others too. I mean, there's a lot available on, uh, on the internet. Um, so who was really sent to Guantanamo? Uh, um, so, so as the months went by, the, the people who were guarding the prisoners and, and other people who were, who were working in Guantanamo began to realize that these were not, you know, hardened terrorists, you know, they, they, they really were nobodies, you know, they were just, uh, as Neely says, they were just young, you know, the no ones. Um, uh, same for Saar, you know, he became, he came to understand that, you know, what they were being told about who these people were was, was not the truth, you know, and as he, as he says, you know, um, these people weren't even vetted, they were just being captured and sent to Guantanamo. Um, and he asks, what extensive vetting process allows an 88 year old to end up at Guantanamo, you know, uh, they sent an 88-year-old man to Guantanamo, uh, so sold sold for bounty. Um, even the Pentagon began to understand that they were filling up Guantanamo with people who what uh, Rumsfeld called low-level enemy combatants. You know, in, in other words, they began to realize that the what they were doing was they were sending like the privates, privates in the Al Qaeda army, or pri you know people who who, uh, you know, privates with the Taliban, Taliban fighters to Guantanamo, and they weren't populating it with the people who planned 9-11 or even any other high-level suspected terrorists. 730. Um, uh, and with nobodies, excuse me? Nope. So the, uh, the, the Geneva Conventions presented an obstacle to the U.S.'s plan. You know, the, uh, the so the U.S. was going to, you know, send these captured prisoners, right, suspected terrorists to Guantanamo. But the, it, uh, the G Geneva Conventions um, had certain requirements that the U.S. had to, had to abide by, right? So, and these presented obstacles to the U.S. The, the first obstacle was the, the Geneva Convention on the Treatment of Prisoners of War, right? It's known as the Third Geneva Convention. And the, the Convention on the Treatment of Prisoners of War protects, um, you know, prisoners in international armed conflicts um, uh, from being abused. You know, at all times they have to be treated humanely and protected, particularly against acts of torture, violence, intimidation, medical experimentation. They must be free to exercise their religion. They have to uh, receive fair trials and punishment if they're charged, and they have to be released uh, when they're repatriated. Um, and if a combatant doesn't meet the definition of a prisoner of war, or the conflict uh, isn't considered an international armed conflict, uh, then they they not only lose the protections as a prisoner of war, but they're also subject to trial and punishment. Um, they're still protected by customary international law um, that are contained in common article three of the Geneva Conventions. Um, the four con Geneva Conventions have two common articles, common article two and common article three. So common article three, um, applies uh, in a non-international armed conflict. In other words, in a conflict that's not between two countries or, or two states. Um, and, and it prohibits, among other things, cruel treatment and torture of persons who have been captured and take no active part in hostilities, um, including members of the armed forces who have laid down their arms or are otherwise out of combat. Out of combat. Without the protection of common Article 3, prisoners are not, uh, that are not prisoners of war can be abused. So you have the first obstacle is 
the the Convention on Prisoners of War. If these if the prisoners at Guantanamo are prisoners of war, they have to be treated according to various standards that are in the Geneva Convention. Um, if they're not prisoners of war, they're still protected by Common Article Three, which re which also requires that they can't be abused or subject to cruel uh, uh, cruel behavior and torture. The third obstacle is the War Crimes Act. Uh, the War Crimes Act is the is the codification of the requirements of the Geneva Convention um, into U.S. law, and it basically says that whoever, whether they're inside or outside the U.S., commits a war crime, where the person committed the war crime is either a victim, um, uh, or the uh, where the of the war crime is either a, a member of the U.S. Armed Forces or is a U.S. national, they're subject to prison or the death penalty. And a war crime includes violations of common articles two and common article three. So um, if you have prisoners at Guantanamo and you violate their rights according to the Geneva Conventions, either article two or article three, you can be charged with a war crime. Um, so uh, um, the, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department um, issued a memo on January 9th uh, 2002. This is now two days before the first prisoners are sent to Guantanamo from uh, Bagram Air Base and elsewhere. Right. Uh, the the author of the memo is John Yu. You have asked whether the laws of armed conflict apply to the conditions of detention and the procedures for trial of members of Al Qaeda and the Taliban militia. Right. In other words, uh, the president has asked for a memorandum. Uh, to to his lawyers, which are the Justice Department, Office of Legal Counsel, saying, look, do the laws of armed conflict, do the Geneva Conventions apply uh, to these prisoners? And the memo argues that it, they don't apply, the conventions don't apply, because uh, Al-Qaeda members are not covered by the conventions, because Al-Qaeda isn't the nation state, so it couldn't be a signatory to the convention, right? The conflict with Al Qaeda is not a is a, is not a non-international armed conflict or, or an international armed conflict, and Al Qaeda members are not POW um, prisoners of war, but they're unlawful enemy combatants um, because they are neither regular armed forces um, or nor do they qualify as the regular armed forces, and the Taliban are uncovered for pretty much the same reasons as well as that Taliban they, the Taliban is not a government and Afghanistan is a failed state. So this is what what you put in his memo, and Bush accepted it, right? President Bush at the time accepted it. Yu's analysis is based on his theory of expansive executive power. Again, back to the people who are in power in the U.S. government who want to extend the president's power. Any congressional effort to restrict presidential authority by subjecting the conduct of the U.S. armed forces to a broad construction of the Geneva Convention one that is clearly not borne by the text, that's his opinion, you know, and almost all other authorities uh, on the Geneva Convention think otherwise, would represent a possible infringement on the presidential president's discretion to direct the military. Secretary of State Colin Powell disagreed with you, and he asked uh, uh, President Bush to reconsider accepting the conclusions of the U memo. Um, uh, President Powell, um, in a letter to Bush, said, look, you know, the, what you is saying reverses a century of U.S. policy and support for the Geneva Conventions. Um, uh, the, you know, uh, this decision will be subject to legal challenges and foreign prosecutors potentially could prosecute U.S. officials and troops on the same reasoning. The presidential council at the time, Alberto Gonzalez, advised President Bush not to reconsider his decision. And uh, importantly, one of the reasons was that it um, by not accept by accepting that the Geneva Conventions don't apply, and therefore that the War Crimes Act uh, wouldn't apply, it would reduce the threat of a criminal prosecution under the War Crimes Act, right? As he said in his in his memo to Bush, a determination that the Geneva Convention is not applicable to the Taliban would mean that the War Crimes Act would not apply to actions taken with respect to the Taliban. In other words, actions taken with respect to their detention and interrogation. The attorney general advised the same thing to uh, President Bush, right? In his uh, memo to, uh, <clears throat> to President Bush, he says, a presidential determination against treaty ap applicability, against the Geneva Conventions applying, 
would provide the highest assurance that no court would subsequently entertain charges that American military officers, intelligence officials, or law enforcement officials violated Geneva Convention rules relating to field conduct, detention conduct, or interrogation of detainees, right? So you can see that the Office of Legal Counsel is advising the president and the president is accepting on the basis of his, uh, of his counsel, right? That um, we're gonna populate uh, Guantanamo with these with these people, suspected terrorists. We're not going to, you know, um, have any of the Geneva Conventions apply, and therefore, whatever actions we take a, a, against them, you know, will will not be um, subject to uh, uh, to criminal prosecution under the War Crimes Act. Um, so, um, capturing and detaining the Al Qaeda and Taliban members led the Office of the Secretary of Defense to inquire in December 2001 about using the military SEER program's counter, uh, counter in, uh, interrogation techniques. So in other words, um, they wanted to question all of these people, interrogate all these people that they've captured, right? And they wanted to use the SEER program's techniques. The, the SEER program, uh, which is a, a survival, evasion, resistance, and escape um, course, it subjects US military and civilian special operators to coercive interrogations as part of a survival course. The interrogations are based on techniques used on prisoners that contravene the Geneva Conventions, particularly techniques used against US prisoners in, in past wars. The SEER interrogation techniques in use, they include waterboarding, stress positions, nakedness, hoods over the head, sleep disruption, exposure to loud music and flashing lights, exposure to extreme temperatures and, and face and, and body slapping. Um, so the Department of Defense and the CIA were concerned that interrogating prisoners using these techniques would lead to prosecution under yet another uh, convention, the UN Convention Against Torture and corresponding US law criminalizing torture. So this was the fourth obstacle, right, to their plan. Uh, their plan, they being the architects of the global war on terror, Cheney and Addington and you and, and the other people in the Office of Legal Counsel and the, and the President uh, and the White House, who were putting together this plan about how they were going to capture and interrogate um, all of these prisoners and extend the President's authority uh, to, to uh, conduct this uh, global war on terror. So the UN Convention Against Torture, right, um, defines torture as uh, any act by which severe, severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person uh, for the purposes of obtaining information or confession, right? Um, and it's inflicted <coughs> with the consent or acquiescence of a public official, right? The U.S. Um, signed the, the Convention Against Torture and it ratified it into law, just like it did with the Geneva Conventions, right? Under U.S. law, Right, torture is defined as uh, means an act committed by a person acting under color of law, specifically intended to inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering on another person. Right, so um, the 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 White House, uh, the DOD, and the CIA wanted to know: Look, are we going to run afoul of the uh, of the torture convention if we um, you know use the SEER techniques? So they asked uh, the Office of Legal Counsel, and, and by this point, it was uh, Bybee uh, was the uh, assistant um, uh, uh, um, attorney general, and his memo, right, um, narrowly interprets what torture means, right? And you have asked our office's view regarding the standards of conduct under the Convention Against Torture. Um, so Bybee's memo narrowly interprets torture, right? What he said, what the memo says is that acts, uh, acts of torture must be of an extreme nature to rise to the level of torture on the level of organ failure, impairment of bodily function, even death, significant psychological harm of significant duration. In other words, it's, it's gone from severe, right, severe suffering and pain, which is what's in the definition of the convention and the, and the U.S. law to extreme, you know, on the level of organ failure. Uh, you know, of death, you know, the, uh, and so by narrowly interpreting torture, it gave a way for the people conducting the, these, these interrogations using the SEER techniques to say that they weren't committing torture, right? The Bybee memo, right, um, also hedges its narrow interpretation of torture, you know, 
aside from uh, saying that the president has authority as commander in chief to to do what whatever he uh, they want in terms of conducting military operations, um, he says even if the interrogation methods violated uh, the uh, the law, the U.S. law, they are justified by the defenses of necessity and self-defense to elicit information to prevent a direct and imminent threat to the U.S. and its citizens. Um, at the same time, uh, Bybee also sent similar memos to the CIA that were that were classified and and were not um, uh, were not revealed until 2009 in litigation brought by the ACLU, and and these memos to the CIA um, came to the same conclusion and, and basically um, said the same thing that the uh, the definition of torture uh, means extreme physical pain on the level of, of uh, organ failure. Um, uh, and and, and um, uh, those, those memos came out in August of 2002. And uh, uh, you know, three years later, they were reaffirmed uh, by Bradbury, um, who, who again um, you know, gave the same definition for torture, right? And it denotes physical pain that is extreme in intensity, you know, and he gives examples, sustained systematic beating, application of electric currents to sensitive parts of the body, tying up or hanging in positions that cause extreme pain. Um, so uh, uh, the Bybee and Bradbury memos to the CIA compare the experience of trainees undergoing the SEER interrogation methods against the definition of torture, right, in the US law. The memos conclude that none of the interrogation methods amount to torture when properly conducted and monitoring. These memos, when you read them, assess the interrogation techniques in a sanitized and ideal manner. For example, right, when it comes to walling, right, walling was a technique where you would push, you could push the prisoner back and forth against a, a false wall, right? And their conclusion is, we understand that this technique is not designed to and does not cause severe pain, even when used repeatedly as you have described, right? Uh, so Shocker in the, in the interview um, uh, that I was gonna show before talks about how, you know, when he was walled, right? He was hit against a concrete wall, not a fake ply, plywood uh, wall. And they just grabbed his head and kept smacking him back and forth, back and forth against the wall. Um, the, uh, um, the, again, um, stress positions, right? Stress positions were explained as, you know, they would be at a certain degree, you would be so many feet away uh, from a wall. And, uh, you know, the conclusion was, as with wall standing, we understand that these positions are used only to induce temporary muscle fatigue. Well, you know, that wasn't the reality. You know, the reality, you know, this is the uh, the, the testimony of, um, of Razak Ali, was that, you know, they would bring them in the room and shackle them in painful positions. They would leave them like that for many hours, and then they'd come in and interrogate them. Um, uh, the reality was just not the way it was presented in these memos, but it, but the memos gave the CIA and the interrogators an out from being prosecuted criminally because it, they could always say, look, we relied on, on, on these memos from the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, this is a, a, a painting from one of the prisoners. It shows how they were short shackled. Short shackled was a position that, that uh, prisoners at Guantanamo, Guantanamo were left in you know sometimes you know more than a day you know, to be squatting like that and and shackled to the floor uh, there so it, it doesn't even it, it's not even the kind of position that's explained in the memorandum um, where they talk about you know what be what a stress position is so um, uh, another form of torture was the hunger strikers and force feeding them. Um, there were three uh, in 2005, 2008, and 2011, 12. The prisoners went on hunger strike uh, in Guantanamo, for, you know, because of their conditions. And so, uh, what would happen is that they would be taken, put in a, a specially made chair um, for for them um, by the same company, I believe, uh, or by a company um, that modeled this chair uh, on the electric chair, and. Um, you know, they're, they're tied to this chair and they're forcibly fed IVs, you know, through the nose or sometimes through other orifices of their body. And, and they would be left like this for hours and, and, and days. Uh, this is the testimony of Mr. Hassan Makbel. Um, uh, by the way, I, I, all of these slides have references to the sources where I get all this information from and those 
um, will be made available to you so that you could always go um, check the sources and and further look into uh, you know um, uh, you know the, what's happened what happened there. So the legal framework implemented um, by the executive allowed for the torture of prisoners at Guantanamo because the captured uh, prisoners there were not subjected to the protections of the Geneva Conventions or the UN Convention Against Torture. They were not allowed access to US courts and they could be tortured by US persons with impunity. Um, as the commanding general at Guantanamo who later went to Abu Ghraib said, the prisoners are like dogs, and if you allow them to believe at any point that they are more than a dog, then you've lost control of them. You know, I mean, basically, uh, you know, the U.S. treated these people like animals, right, and, and worse. Um, so post-release from Guantanamo, um, uh, so, uh, you know, people have been released from Guantanamo. About a third have been sent to third countries, um, and, and in these countries, they're subject to harassment, they're threatened with expulsion from housing and deportation. They're constantly monitored, restricted from travel. There's no respect from their culture. You know, you can imagine a, a Muslim from Algeria or Morocco or elsewhere going to one of the, you know, the, a country in Eastern Europe, you know, Serbia or Kazakhstan, where there's no respect at all for the Muslim culture. Um, and they, uh, importantly, they don't get in, they get inadequate medical care. Um, or for some, it's more prisons. 18 Yemenis, uh, were released in 2012, um, and they spent five more years imprisoned in, in the United Arab Emirates um, after they were released from Guantanamo, or um, well, they were released in 2016, and they spent five years further imprisoned in the UAE. Um, the other uh, uh, thing to know about Guantanamo is that it's not just um, at Guantanamo, it's around the world. Uh, there are Guantanamos all over the world, uh, places that we don't know to, run by other um, uh, you know, uh, uh, empire countries, uh, you know, like like Russia and the, and and uh, China and, and Saudi Arabia and others. Um, and, and what Daryl Lee is a legal anthropologist, um, and uh, he explains that you know, look, you know, the way to look at this is a global carceral circulation system where you, where people are 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 uh, are abducted or kidnapped in one country, sent. You know, like like you can take uh, Mohamed Uslahi, who was the Mauritanian. So he was uh, he turned himself in in Mauritania, and then he was sent to Jordan for eight months, uh, where he was you know beaten, and then from Jordan he went to uh, Bagram, and then from Bagram he's sent to Guantanamo, and then when he's released from Guantanamo he's back to Mauritania. So prisoners just have, there's this circulation of, of prisoners that the US and other empires have where they capture people and they send them from one country in one jail to another country in another jail. And this is the way empires use their client states to do their bidding. Um, uh, so um, to wrapping it up, I just wanted to, to put some figures here. So the estimate of the US post 9-11 war spending is about $8 trillion. That means that since 9-11, the U.S. spent $8 trillion, trillion dollars, $8 trillion on the global war on terror, right? And uh, the, this information is from the Watson Institute at Brown University that has done the studies. Um, and, and this is money that obviously could have gone to help our communities, could have gone for healthcare, could have gone for any number of things that would have made the world a better place. Um, and instead, it, it went to promoting, you know, more wars and the destruction that we saw and the violence that we saw. Um, and in terms of the human cost, the Watson Institute uh, puts the cost of the of the 9-11 wars at around uh, a million, 897,000 to 929 million. And in my view, the figure is probably higher. But and then lastly, um, uh, you know, the mentality of Guantanamo has seeped um, into the US prison system as well. You know, we all know about the militarization of our police, right, from all of the weapons from war. Well, it's the same with departments of corrections. You know, now uh, it, what, what we have in federal prisons are special administrative measures. And these are imposed on top of solitary confinement. And what they do is they deprive the prisoner of, uh, of uh, um, human contact and communication and, and subject them to sensory deprivation. You know, uh, they include, all right, separate sensory deprivation and social isolation. Um, for example, physical isolation, 
smaller cell, light restriction, you're not allowed out of the cell, um, spiritual isolation, you know, your, your practice of religion is, is uh, sharply restricted, not allowed to go to prayer groups, information isolation, where you don't have access to information or anything. So um, you, you, you have to think of Guantanamo not just as some, a, a phenomenon or something that the empire does around the world, but it, it, it's also internal. You, you have this internalization of the, of the mentality of the mentality of incarceration in the U.S. prison system. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Guantanamo, I have a, you know, I have a, a slide at the end, and you'll get these slides. Um, and it just lists organizations and films uh, and databases uh, that, that you can consult. Uh, as far as databases go, the University of California at Davis has the Guantanamo Testimonials Project. And what it has is interviews with people who worked at Guantanamo and with prisoners. It has guards, nurses, doctors, <coughs> translators, as well as prisoners. It, it's actually a very interesting database uh, for if when you have time to go through and just to, to hear and read uh, the transcripts of some of the interviews. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of books. I just put down, you know, sort of the uh, the ones that uh, that come to mind. Uh, but there's there's other ones. Uh, so that's. Uh, uh, that's it, uh, 50 minutes. So I, I'm, I, I'd be glad to take any questions or to, um, or if you have any questions in the chat or just to answer any questions. Um, and, and thank you so much for listening. And I Frank, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Martha has asked if um, before we start the questions. And I, thank you, Frank. Um, so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. There was uh, a question about the redacted book of um, Muhammadu al-Slahi and whether or not uh, it, because of, you know, if there's a, an updated version that is less redacted or. There is, uh, uh -huh. and, and, it, and it's now titled The Mauritanian, okay? And, and in it, um, I don't know if you can see, but whatever was redacted in Guantanamo diary has now been unredacted, but it shows you where the redactions were so mm. that you can see what the former blanking out was. Mm. Uh, so yes, and this is uh, the, the, right, the, the Mauritanian and it's uh, by Back Bay Books, um, 2017. So yes. And Frank, how is it that it's redacted now? What allowed, what happened that allowed for those changes? Uh, that I don't know. I'd have to read the, the, to, to see again. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to read uh, the, uh, maybe they did it for the movie. I don't know. Because they, the book came out with the movie, so. And uh, there's a question for you. Um, do you think uh, there are actually any torture tapes somewhere? I, I don't know. Uh, as far as I know, the, the, the CIA had destroyed them all. Um, and, you know, whether there any exist or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's and, testimony. I mean, you just need to hear the testimony of those, you know, poor souls who were tortured, you know, mm -hmm. people who were waterboarded 83 times or more. You know, the, the testimony is all there and you can read it, you know, and it's been put out by many sources. So, mm -hmm. And a follow up to that uh, or a separate question, can Guantanamo ever be closed? Um, I, you know, I don't know because what I, what I do, what I do know is that we can get the prisoners out of there that are there now, but you know, the, the Guantanamo was used as a holding place for Haitians and Cubans in the 90s. And, you know, the way the way the U.S. is, you know, 20 or years from now or 15 or five years from now, some other population will be put in there. I, you know, the 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 base is used by the military for, the you know, for the purposes of its empire. And, and, and I think it'll always be used uh, until, you know, um, it goes back to Cuba, which I hope it does someday. But yeah, but but you know, the, I mean, the, the families of the victims of 9/11, or, or at least many of them, 
um, as well as you know, uh, you know, a good number of senators and representatives do want to do want to depopulate the prison there now. From you know, the the twenty the twenty three who have not been charged, you know, sh they want to release them. You know, it's it's uh, it's you know, uh, the, the process is too slow in my view, and and uh, and it's too late. Um, and the remaining people who are going to be supposedly tried on for war crimes, uh, I think the Senate with the 9-11 families are considering a, a plea bargain to, to uh, avoid having to have a trial. Um, and the plea bargain would be something along the lines of um, they'll take the death penalty off the table and they'll just uh, plead guilty and reveal any further information they have about what they know about. Um, uh, the Thank you, Frank. Uh, the next question is, can you talk about the Mitchell Jensen psychologists? Yeah, so uh, Mitchell and Jensen were two psychologists who had worked uh, with the SEER program, and they were asked um, by the military to come and actually refine the SEER techniques that would be used to interrogate the, the prisoners at the black sites and uh, at Guantanamo. So they uh, they were paid about eighty two million dollars for oh. consulting uh, the yeah for their consulting the DoD and the CIA about how to refine the uh, SEER techniques yeah. Uh, next question: Will the Bush administration officials responsible ever be held accountable? I I doubt it. I mean they haven't already. Uh, you know certainly President Obama. Didn't want to do it, you know. Didn't want to bring charges, and you know, neither uh, did uh, President Trump. Neither will President Biden. So I, I don't think so. I, I, I think that, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. You know, this is, uh, you know, you're dealing with an empire, and so the, you know, the, uh, the government wants to look forward, not look back. And, and not make amends and, you know, not recognize, you know, the, the violence uh, that it did um, or, or deny it altogether. Um, there's a, a comment, not a question, just from Barbara, thanking you for presenting to us tonight. Mm. She's also wishing anybody who's celebrating Gaudete Sunday Happy that to all, and may the path to justice be open and shared by all. For what reason do you believe George W. Bush is remaining so silent? I, I, I don't know. I mean, if it's silent about Guantanamo and the black sites, um, I, it's because he doesn't want to open up a can of worms. Mm-hmm. Any comments regarding the surprise listing of Palestine as one of the locations of the circular sites? Seems a contradiction, says Denny, to the backing of Israel with 35 billion plus annually. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, the, the Israeli, you know, Israel will capture Palestinians. It'll put them in, the, uh, in what are black sites. Or, or you know, part of this carceral system, and uh, and people get lost. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, you can read any number of places. You know, Egypt, uh, Libya, Syria. Uh, you know, Israel. Yeah. So I, I, um, I. It's terrible. It, you know, look, uh, we live in a world where violence, um, um, you know, is is accepted, and 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 state violence is is accepted, um, uh, because of the way the elite who run governments um, operate um, the, uh, I, you know, um, yeah, so. I think maybe Denny was surprised that it was listed publicly that they were one of these circular sites, but there it is. And someone had mentioned in the chat earlier, I believe that Israel uses the SER, the S-E-R-E, um, techniques that you described. Yeah. I mean, some of these places are published, are, are, are made public. The one in Bosnia is um, as well. Um, but, you know, you'll never know what really goes on there unless someone comes out and, and tell, and, you know, it's, you know, um, 
explains, you know, tells. Uh, that's the that's the the key thing. Uh, another question, Frank, is uh, what is your personal experience with visiting Guantanamo and working with uh, Abdul Malik there? I, I I've been there three times, and uh, the my the personal experience is that. Um, you you know, so uh, let me put it this way: I've represented other prisoners, you know, in in the U.S. and and I've been in prison myself for for acts of civil disobedience. So uh, the first thing for me is to just um, treat the prisoner humanely as a person and to get to know them. So Abdul Malik and I, um, before we even sit down to talk like legal stuff you know uh, i'll sit down and and we'll talk about what our favorite books are what our favorite poems are right um you know um I, i'll ask he likes to sing so i'll ask him to you know sing a song you know then i'll i'll um you know do my part at singing you know the, the, i mean the, the 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 first part of the experience is you have to you know you have to be a human being to another human being and then after that, um, you know, you know, we'll, we'll talk about legal stuff, but you know, it, it's under a very harsh condition. I mean, you know, legal visits are controlled. You know, they're they're watched um, or surveyed. Uh, so you know, you have to be careful what you say and what you don't say. Um, and uh, I, I mean, the guards are all young. American, mostly males, some some female, um, and, and they're all nice and courteous, and and it kind of like can throw you off, you know, because you have to remind yourself that, yeah, you know, they're nice and they're courteous, but you know, <laughs> you're in like a, a you know a, a maximum security type prison um, where people are treated harshly, you know, even now, I I mean, you know, no one, you know, as far as I know, you know, it's not. The Guantanamo isn't the way it was in 2002 and 2003, but people are still, you know, um, uh, kept under restrictive conditions, uh, you know, the, and I mean, to me, it's torture not to have seen your family for 15, 16 years, uh, or to be told that you can be released, and yet you're still waiting after a year or two years. So, you know, so the, the personal experience is that you have to, I have to always keep in mind that I'm, I'm, I'm with another human being and I have to act like a human being, right? And, and not be fooled by the conditions, you know, or by the, uh, the, the courteousness uh, of the military uh, guards um, or, the, or the pleasantness of the, of, the, of the geography of Guantanamo. I mean, you know, we took a very beautiful part of Cuba away from Cuba, you know, and it's sad. You know? um... We will be gathering in Augusta at the Armory on January 14th to stand in solidarity with the men in Guantanamo and to demand their release. Um, it'll be at one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, so. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to leave everybody on, on a bummer, on a bummer, you know. So what I'll say is that, that is that, you know, I mean, look, Guantanamo is just one part of the, you know, of the violence that's all around uh, all around us in many ways, and so, uh, like like uh, Mary Kate said at the beginning, you know, whatever we can do uh, to make the world a better place, you know, we can we can do and and try to do, and you know, community helps. You know, we all help support each other. So, you know, and that's a good thing. So, whether it's you know demonstrating or or uh, you know um, helping out or or, you know, writing to your, to your representative, you know, whichever way you, you want to help, it's, it's a good thing. And whether it's Guantanamo or any other of the injustices that, that we have, they're all related, really. So, yeah. So thank you. Um, and uh, everybody have a good holiday. <laughs> Frank, we thank you so much. There are just a few thank yous in the chat, and we'll just uh, give you the old Zoom thanks okay. from everyone. And Thank we you. so appreciate someone said it was a, a perfectly appropriate way to spend Human Rights Day. And okay. thanks again to the co-sponsor.